Are you looking to see AI, machine learning, data science, and deep learning be used in an actual business application? Like say, are you kind of, you know the basics of machine learning, you know how to create stuff with deep learning, you know TensorFlow. Now, how do I use this in an actual useful project, useful situation? This is the video for you. This notebook will be linked in the description below, and I'm gonna go over it in depth right now throughout the rest of the video. So essentially, Picture yourself in a bank, right? They wear suits in finance, so I'm gonna wear this. A manager at a local bank is kind of just wondering why are some of their customers leave? So they essentially create a credit card service. That's what they create. And about 16% of the current users are what's called churning. So they're leaving the service. And the manager wants to find out why, and then also create some kind of prediction model that allows that allows the sales team to kind of pinpoint which customer is most likely to leave, and then therefore focus their attentions and give their efforts and deals and promotions and all that kind of stuff on the customers that are most likely to leave. That's the problem, and it's kind of like a two-part problem that they hired you, uh, the data scientist. So that's business team so you want to you're essentially creating a binary classification model and you're also doing some data visualization for the sales team and you can see the objective here identify churning customers with binary classification as well as do some visuals with do some nice visuals like plotly and seaborn which we will see shortly you can see the the uh, i guess time frame right here so, and, and also there is a slight issue that 16% of the customers are churned. So if I were to do this again, I would definitely use a data upsampling method. I didn't use it in this particular notebook and I got pretty good results, but if this were, if I were doing this for an actual job, then I would probably would be if I were a professional data scientist, which I will hope to be one day. So the backend engineer gives us the bank this kind of table through their MySQL database I did have to remove, there are these two columns that he gave us because for some reason he tried to create his own like naive Bayes classifier and he didn't really work out but he still left it for us. Real world issues. So yeah. And then also there is this client num which is just an identification of the number. It's not like the prime, it's not really the primary key, it's just like account number so that the back end of what like the web app that the bank provides the customer can go to their bank account can kind of identify them it's a unique identifier number it actually be a foreign key if you're in sql but yeah if you look at these these are kind of the 18 to 19 variables that will that we are given in this table so we're given things like the gender we're given the age of the customer how many dependents they have what their education is marital status income as well as just various properties about their account on the card as well. And we're gonna see that pretty much the users who are most likely to leave are users who don't really use their card that often and who aren't really like exchanging a lot of money with it. And our essentially our target variable, which is kind of what we're trying to classify is called attrition flag. Attrition flag is just a binary variable that's saying existing customer or a customer that's gonna leave or churn. So yeah, so this is some visualization I did. There's a simple plotly pie chart, you know, just a simple, I, I kind of also split it up into existing attrited customers right here. So you know that the data is not balanced and it's up to us to kind of balance it. And our gender is pretty much split. Education, it's kind of, I guess, mixed. Uh, based on the education level, my guess is that this is probably, and, and also the income as well. So like 35% of the bank is le makes less than 40K per year, which is that in US dollars, uh, 40K, which is actually kind of, the, depending where you are, it's kind of near the poverty line. Of course, depending, that greatly depends on whether you have a family or not and which state you're in. Like 40K in California versus 40K in like Michigan or Iowa is very different. <laughs> but my guess is that this bank is a credit union. This is probably not a, uh, 
is probably not a big bank if they're if they're gonna but I don't know maybe it's just the certain area I have I have no idea really what area this data comes from all I know is that's you know it's from a bank uh, marital status you got there pretty much split and um, these are kind of the plans of the card as well so most people go with the blue and silver and gold and there's platinum so it's I guess that's pretty that's pretty fair and here's gonna be some box and whisker plots as well as some distributions as we'll see here so we can see that the customers that are most likely to leave are kind of gonna hold less credit cards so number of products is the amount of credit cards they have so as customers that are continuing to use it most of them are gonna hold more than like three to five cards and my guess is that they're going to be probably married people who have spouses who also use the same credit card as the husband. Maybe they have a kid who is setting up a credit card with them and they're also using it. Maybe it's a kind of a big family, who knows. But customers that are most likely to leave are more likely to be skewed in the two to three range. They're less likely, they're going to have less credit cards. And then number of months with no transactions of the year, it's gonna be a little bit higher for customers as well. It's kind of gonna be less of a range because you know if they're gonna have not as many transactions, it's more likely that they're gonna leave. And then here's credit limit. It's a little bit higher on this side for the attrited, for the customer that's likely gonna leave, which means that they're gonna have likely a higher credit limit. Uh, total revolving balance, so that's kind of the balance you have to pay in. In addition, you have to pay it with interest. So that's kind of money that you don't pay. I guess they they have a lot less of it compared to the people who stay. And my my get my inference on this is that they're likely to have a lot less revolving balance. That means they know they can't pay it off, which means they're probably less likely to have kind of money and less likely to use it. You know, An existing customer who has a revolving balance may maybe have they might have some like debt they're paying off or something they're paying off that they know they're going to get money back from compared to the customers that are going to leave and then obviously customers that are going to leave are going to have less transactions in the last year so you can see it's kind of like higher here and here so there's a lot more red in the 20 to 4 20 to 60 range than there is blue which means there's a lot more uh, I'm gonna have a lot less transactions, which kind of, I guess, correlates with how much they're using the credit card, which definitely correlates with whether or not they're gonna leave. And then change in the transaction number, they're gonna have slightly less transaction as well. And here I actually made a correlation matrix. And I essentially, what this shows you is it kind of, it just pretty much compares every categorical variable against each other, not just categorical, numerical as well, just compares every variable against each other and sees how well they're correlated. So in our case, we want to see essentially things like credit limit and utilization radio that you're open to buy, as well as your total transaction amount and your total relationship count. So that's how many like months you've been with the bank. And this kind of told us that the most correlated features was a lower transaction change. So what that means to the business team is that essentially, if you see a customer who doesn't like you doesn't have a lot of like transaction, a low amount of money with, that they're transactioning. Not it's also transaction like time, so they have fewer transactions and fewer amounts of money being transacted as well. And they're gonna have a lower revolving balance and number of contacts are most correlated. You can read through some here, here, some of the other things here. All right, now sales team, we're done with you. Now let's do some data pre-processing. We're gonna pre-process this so that we can essentially make the data so that our machine learning models can best use them. And we're essentially converting categorical features to numbers and we're also gonna be doing some scaling. So uh, for these two things, for these two categories, they're male or female, so the gender, as well as if they're a customer that's gonna leave or not, I just made it binary because there's only two values. But the other ones, the other categories are all, um, they're kind of re related as well. So if you look at the, I guess, I guess the best example would be the education. So 
in the education in the education category, you can think of it as kind of like a like a progression. So, for example, what I mean is that the postgraduate degree and the doctorate degree are higher levels than the uneducated or the high school. That's just the degree level. So, the variable the these categorical variables are related to each other in order. That is why we use an ordinal encoder instead of like a one-hot encoder, for example. So I just ordinal encoded these, especially with income. So the less than 40K is a lot less than the 120K. And ma order does matter here. So that's why we use an ordinal encoder. So we got all our categorical variables into numbers, which is great. And it's also good that these numbers are kind of small, which means there's not a huge like distribution. But some of these like some of these columns have like say seven thousand seven hundred. This is eleven thousand. So we kind of need to scale those down just so that our machine learning models can predict things better. So we're going to use a standard scaler, and that's what it does. And what what a standard scaler does is essentially kind of it uses a I don't remember the exact formula. You can look it up, but it kind of it factors in the variance and the mean. So it kind of squishes it between um, like squishes it between a small number so it's usually either zero one or like zero to five or just kind of a small number I think in our case it is zero to one it's kind of squishes things with, by also taking count of the variance you can think of it as probably also like percentage wise as well and here I just I did it. everything I did above I just put it into one function just so that later on we're gonna use this function right here just to pre-process everything in one spot I just you know did some very basic stuff there now onto the machine learning models this was actually kind of funny and that um, I just used some very basic out-of-the-box functions I just use random forest k nearest neighbors support vector machine and our good friend the XG boost and I use these things without even like without even touching their hyperparameters. I mean, I, I guess I used that, the end neighbors, but yeah, I just didn't touch the hyperparameters, which is weird. And I got like a 95% accuracy, 97% accuracy without even touching it. Now, um, in reality, my guess is that there's some kind of overfitting going on. Uh, I, I don't really have a way to prove it yet because there, this data set doesn't come with like extra data. It's it's not it's not really a comp it's not a Kaggle competition. It's a data set, so I can't really prove it. Maybe if they add more data in the future, I can train I can test this model and and tell whether or not it is overfitting or not. But out of the box, we got some pretty good results with our random forest and XG boost, which is kind of the models that they're my go-to models because they're they are really good. Now the neural network. So after that, it was you might it might sound silly, you know. Why would I use a neural network when I can get these high accuracy amounts with just these basic things? And you would be right. <laughs> but I decided to make it anyway because I like doing this stuff. So it's just a very basic sequential neural network right here using TensorFlow. We got some batch normalization right there, and also some dropout just so that. It kind of doesn't converge too slowly. I'll, if you don't know what that means, that's fine. I'll, I'll show you in a graph in a really clear example below. So I compiled it, I fit it, train it. This learning rate, I had to mess around with so much, as well as also the complexity of this model. Initially, the model I had like four, five hidden layers with like 200 neurons, and it turns out to kind of overfit. So yeah, you can. See here, this model, actually the curve is pretty good. It kind of starts high and then goes low and it converges to a fairly good accuracy. So its accuracy is about 85%, which 85% is okay, but if you compare it with the 95 and 97% of the model we didn't use, we barely trained, then, you know, it's kind of like a situation of cracking open an egg with a sledgehammer if you know what I mean. That's what's going on with this. But, you know, it's still good to have it. I, I still use the neural network, you'll, you'll see. But yeah, it was, I guess, it, it was a lot to kind of just configure this and play around with this, you know. Initializations, I did act, different activation functions. And yeah, that's that. Here's the curve. 
And then I also made it into a scikit-learn model using the base estimator and classifier mixin, which just allows you to create essentially a custom scikit-learn machine learning model. And the reason I needed this was because I just put it into an ensemble, specifically a voting classifier with soft voting. Where is it? Uh, voting is soft there. Soft voting just means that we're dealing with probabilities rather than like strictly binary predictions. So all of these machine learning models technically output a probability. So a number between zero and hundred, whether or not this is a certain, whether or not it classifies this as a certain category. So it kind of soft just means that it take factors in, it, it kind of weights the higher accurate models more than the lower accurate, but the lower accurate models can still help the overall uh, model itself. And I got a 96 point, uh, nine, nine, roughly 97% accuracy, which I feel is very good. And I think we impressed our bank manager right there. And um, here's the conclusion, total transaction change, revolving balance, and just the amount of contacts they had are most correlated with the customer that's gonna leave. And yeah, that's that's the notebook right there. If you enjoyed, then check this out in the description below. Maybe upvote it or comment about comment, ask me anything. And yeah, this was using machine learning and deep learning in an applied context, in an applied useful business context. Thank you for watching.